Hey guys, I got a question for you. Have you ever heard of the blessing of the Father? It's something very powerful that we can observe throughout the entire Bible. And my guest this week is someone who has studied it, someone who came from a fatherless background, uncovered this powerful truth in scripture and literally changed his legacy. And now he's focused on changing the legacy of men all around him through his ministry called Blessing of the Father. Ed McGlasson is on a mission to call fathers back to their children and children back to their fathers. He was the lead pastor of the Stadium Vineyard Church for over 34 years, and he also was an offensive lineman in the NFL with the Giants, the Jets, and the Rams. And he's the author of many books, including one that I just read. And guys, I love it. I'm endorsing it. I want you to get this book. It's called How to Become the Husband and Father Your Family Need. We talk all about this book throughout this interview, the powerful concepts, the principles to help you unlock yourself, understand where you are in your journey so you can be the husband and father your family needs. Let's get into it. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Raising the Standard, Leadership and Mindset Development for the Kingdom Man. I got a really special episode lined up for you right now. I'm joined by my guest, Ed Tandy McGlasson. Ed, welcome to the show. Hey, it's great to be with you, brother. Oh, by the way, I'm going to give you a shout out. If you've not got this book, guys, you need a standard. See, without a standard... I mean, what's the level? You want to go to the next level? Right here, baby. Get there. Josh's <laughs> book. It's powerful. Uh, I'm honored. I am honored, Ed, especially coming from you. You are a real father. You carry the father's heart. You're doing great things for men. And uh, you know, because in the standard, I talk about this as well. There's a crisis right now. So let, let's jump right into it because I've read your book. I read it in one day. I was enthralled by it. I literally laughed out loud. Um, there were some parts that were just like, it was like watching and reading the movie of your life. I got pulled into it and there was so much power in what you unpacked there. So the name of the book is How to Become the Husband and Father Your Family Needs. And this was so powerful for me, but let's just start with a quick introduction of who you are to introduce you to this audience that may or may not know your work. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm a, a veteran of uh, the New York Giants and the Los Angeles Rams. Met my wife on a blind date and uh, started having kids. And I knew how to make a baby, but I really struggled being a father. I couldn't I couldn't stop making my marriage about me. I couldn't stop making my kids about their performance on the field. You know, dads, when you're sitting in the stands and you think that your genetic output is greater than the genetic output of the guy sitting next to you who has a say, has a son in the game. You know those moments. I've even coached those teams. But I struggled as a dad, and it had nothing to do with how much I love my kids. But I was missing something that m many of us guys miss, and I was missing. Uh, I was missing my my dad and my story. My dad was killed in action a month before I was born, and so i i never I never got to talk to him. Never got to find out what he thought about me. And so when a boy's born that way, or his dad doesn't know how to be that in his life, what does he do? He, and that's what I did. I spent my whole life trying to name myself and, you know, push myself. I'm, you know, started eating like a football player, trying to break that now. Worked out like a football player, had some great coaches, legendary coaches, you know, um, from Bill Barcells to you know, Bill Belichick and in the NFL learned a lot about football, but the thing that matters to me and it matters to every father that's uh, watching is, you know, I want to be a better father. How do I do it? And 
my story is about that. And I want to ask you, when you were growing up, not growing up, ever knowing your father, was that part of the drive to become a professional athlete? Is that what was pushing you as you were looking for something, as you were excelling and you just happened to find sports as an outlet for yourself? Yeah. And, you know, my mother remarried uh, Dan McGlasson, hence my name, Ed Tandy McGlasson. And he was a big football guy from the Naval Academy. And my dad actually played at UCLA, my real father at UCLA as tackle and then transferred to the Naval Academy and played football. And, and so, but my, it's what my mother did. My mother would, you know, how moms have this voice, they change. And she looked at me and goes, you know, your dear father who gave his life for our country had one dream (laughs) that he could play professional football, son. And if you, his one and only son could, could maybe make it one day. He would look down from heaven and be so proud. That screws up a kid, Josh. Wow. <laughs> I got a like a dead dad in heaven watching me. I got a stepdad who's on the sidelines. He was my coach for much of my young life, driving me. And so it's like, if I don't make it and perform, then I'm nobody. And that's that's one of the huge traps of getting your identity and what you do for a living or sports or a job. What happens when you lose your job? Then who are you? What happens if you lose your marriage and now you're a single dad and the courts are trying to separate you from your son or your daughter? And you're like, oh, what do I do? Where's your identity? And I, so that identity would shift for me. And I struggled. I I tried to get it in ministry, to get a name from being a a pastor or evangelist that traveled with Billy Graham's team and did crusades and did these, all these things. None of those names, none of them ever, uh, ever completed me. I haven't bench pressed the most weight in the history of the football National po- Football League, 605 pounds. And I thought maybe that would be a moment. But those were, I mean, God used all that kind of stuff, but that was my attempt to try to, to prove myself to my dead dad. And, and when you're doing that, the one thing that happens without you meaning it to, and that's where guys struggle, is that you're not giving attention to the, your wife the way she needs because you're trying to arrive. You're not giving attention to your children who are very much like you going, hey, daddy, who am I? Who do you see me to be? And when fathers learn how to be present and bless their kids, I mean, their children, they, they, they start at a level in this crazy world we're in right now that um, see, I pray more for people who meet my kids and I'm worried about my children because I raise my children to make demons tremble, not the other way around because they're clear about who they are. They're connected to the Lord in their life, Lord Jesus. They know the word and they're outspoken purveyors of truth. And that just, blesses me as a dad that they caught all that way before I did. That's awesome, man. You know, I I heard a couple things in in what you just shared there. So first of all, I want to ask you about, you know, we have men, we're given this mandate to perform or we find our identity in what we do. It's really typical with, with the job that we take or whatever that goal in life that we're chasing, that we're pursuing, and we finally get it and we think it's going to complete us and then it doesn't. So I heard you say that you went after that through your career as an athlete and getting into the NFL and the different records that you got. But then also you brought up something that I've seen just growing up in church and being a part of Christianity and the culture is that you said when you got into ministry, you thought that would fulfill you in terms of what you were doing. And even that 
didn't give you the missing piece. And I find that interesting. I want you to speak about that for a moment because it shows us a couple of things. It shows us that no one's immune from this, whether you've been a Christian for a while, whether you don't know the Lord, whether you're at the top of your game, whether you're struggling, many men, no matter what their background is or, or where they are in their relationship with the Lord, if they're missing what we're going to talk about today, the blessing of the Father, they're still going to be empty and looking for validation from someone or something. That's right. Well, it's the it's the curse that was on Adam that we all inherited. Remember what that was? You shall what? Earn your living by the sweat of your brow. And when you're pushing yourself to name yourself or achieve something on earth, Nothing replaces the identity that Adam lost in the garden with God. Adam was created in the image and likeness of the one the Father loved. And who was that? Jesus. He was creating the image of the Son of God, right? When Adam and Eve sinned, they lost access to the Father. They lost access to discovering what that image can be. The whole Old Testament's laid out to really prove that you you can't even keep the Ten Commandments. <laughs> yeah, let for, alone over 600. <laughs> sin. Christ comes now, dies on a cross in our place, pays the rights so that we can receive forgiveness. And he pays the rights for our adoption so that we could be adopted and get a new name where our name isn't by the sweat of our brow, but it's about the image of the Son of God and that we could be beloved sons. And I love this scripture in, in 2 Corinthians. It says, although we were born in the image of the man of dust, we shall bear the image of the man of heaven. That's like the whole Bible, right? Right there in a the verse. We were born in the image of... Uh, of the man of dust. We, like everybody else, and they call it the rat race out there. Let's go out there, make a living, and do all that. And see, the problem is when you couch your life in what you do, or now today in the crazy political world, people are couching their their uh, true identity as a Democrat or a progressive or a Republican, or we got whole groups that their whole identity is couched in their in their sexual choices, as though that's their true identity. And all of those things, all of those things, they will never bring you to this place where you get to experience this incredible gift of salvation and forgiveness and God's undescribable gift of sonship that he gives to you and I as men and in, our, in the same daughtership for those gals that are born, this identity where we get to be sons and daughters of, of God in, in a way that we don't need our dads to make it right. Because our dads really were only able to give us, Josh, what they carried from their own fathers. And when their dads weren't good at blessing them, or they didn't discover this relationship with Christ, they they know that they have very little little to give to us. And that's one of the reasons why dads hold back. They 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 get silent. They don't know what to do because they know they don't have it in their wallet. It's like, hey dad, I need a hundred bucks. He knows he's got ten. And he feels bad that he has ten and he doesn't have it. He wants to give it to you as a good father, but what what can I possibly give you? And that was my story, uh, Josh, before I discovered that he, God wanted to be the father of my story too, so that I could have this moment as a son to be able to say to my kids, I got something in my wallet for you. And when I pray for you and bless you, you fundamentally are going to be different because you won't just be my kids. You're going to be sons and daughters of God the Father himself. And I mean, that revelation of that, as easy as it says to me to say, was a profound shift in my entire family. But it started with me. 
and it starts with every guy who's watching this. The more you open your life to being fathered by God like Jesus, because most, most guys go to church, repent of their sins. You know, I'm not what I need to be. I'm going to try harder. And somehow it's not been communicated in some places like, oh, did you know that God the Father himself wants to father you in your life and teach you all the things your dad didn't have to give you so you can let your dad off the hook and forgive him for what he didn't have in his wallet? And you can learn how to tap into every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places that Ephesians talk about in Christ. That when God the Father opens up his wallet for you, all the resources you need, the grace you need, the, the, the power you need, the identity you need will be yours. And when God names you, there's no shame. When God names you, he has provision that changes who you are. When God names you, you get to experience this this unconditional love of the Father and the Son, and this word shalom, he speaks over your story, and which also means healing in Hebrew. He says, no, I'm going to heal your life. And that's, that's, his, that's his idea of, of family. And that's what radically began to reshape me because I was a self-made man like anybody else out there. I worked so hard at proving myself. And it didn't matter how many football games I won. It didn't matter if I was a game ball guy, captain of the team. I got a lot of awards being an athlete. But all I ever really wanted, I mean, honestly, at the end of the day, I wanted to know, hey, Dad, what do you think about me? What do you really think about me? Do I have what it takes? Am I going to make a difference with my life? And when your dad knows how to resource that, and when you learn that as a father to your kids, it will change their world. Because they'll, they'll start, start shifting from performing to get your approval to wanting to build a relationship with you as their dad, and they let you in. And man, that's, that's, that's the sweetest part of being a dad. That's, a, that's an amazing breakdown of everything you just walked us through there, Ed, and how you weaved your story into that. And what's so powerful about this is that many men, we're talking to, to Christian men that listen to this, have to listen to this podcast, and you've been ministering to men within the church. And you talked about there's a lot of these guys within the church that have these father wounds. And we find that even within Christianity, we're taught all these different ways that we catch. Sometimes they're taught overtly, and sometimes we catch them from being in different services or from attitudes, religious mindsets, where we just don't always relate to God as our father. We think about him as a judge, or we think about him as sovereign, and we have all these great words that describe his majesty and his awesomeness and how powerful he is. But there's something there where we need this restoration, and it's really what you focus on is bringing back into focus the Father. Yeah, so I mean, powerful. you know, why do you think? Let me ask you this: You already know this, but why do you think it's much easier for a guy to see God as a judge or somebody aloof or some kind of a superpower than a father? What would you say? I would say that that's what they saw modeled for them from their earthly father is most likely where that's coming from. Right. I mean, Nietzsche said the, the, the kind of inventor of, of so much stuff said, you know, I hate my father. Therefore, I hate God. Therefore, there is no God. And the, the first image, I tell guys this all the time, the first image of who God the Father is to your sons and daughters is how present you are in their life. 
And the more access you give them to you, the more you talk to them, play with them, love them, roll on the floor with them, speak life into them, it builds it builds this pathway for them that, number one, I'm not alone. My dad's got my back. And somehow in the transfer of that moment with your kids, they get this, well, then God's a father, too. It's not a huge leap. But when you don't have that, and because, and, and here's the other thing, too. No matter how bad our dads are, I, I've yet to meet a guy who doesn't want to totally demonize his dad. He looks for something good. Because we want our dads to be successful. We, we want our dads to be in our life. We want a dad we can be proud of and go, hey, man, have you seen my dad? And for us as, as dads, is there anything sweeter? I thought about this the other day. Just uh, imagine, you know, Josh, you, uh, your kids had just spent uh, the day with one of your best friends. And he calls you up and says, Josh, I need to tell you something. Hey, what's that, bud? You know, your children all day long, all they kept doing is telling me about how much they love you as their dad because of all the things you do. See, in my world, that's touchdown. Yeah, right? Because that's, that's what I want as a dad. I, I'm not a father so they can go, oh, what a great father you are. I'm a father so that my children go, my, my, dad's, my dad's the bomb, man. My, my dad laid his life down. My dad went to work every day. And to help, he wasn't perfect, but he went to work every day, and he he provided for me. My dad loves me. My dad was in my life, and and even if our dads weren't, we want that from our fathers. And here's the good news for me, anyway. After losing my dad and my stepdad struggled because his dad was was strong. It was a you know Cajun daddy that you know you know don't don't cry, boy. Go kick some puppies and get tough. You know it's like. You know, this crazy, you know, man-like thing. And yet all he ever wanted to know is, Dad, what do you think about me? That's what I see, you know, over deathbeds when I've been there as a pastor and a dad's getting ready to go to heaven. The kids are, some of the kids are weeping because they never got that from their dad. Others are weeping because they know how much he meant to them, and he, they don't want him to go. And here's the, the 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 great news for everyone who's listening is that you can really be the father that your children need right now. And by the way, is there ever been a time for fathers to turn back towards their kids and their family more than their jobs, their career, all their stuff, their boats, their hobbies? their politics, if there's ever been a time in history in our country and the world, it's right now. And if we do, and I believe that God's raising up godly men like you, Josh, and, and many, I've met a, a young squire in that's it's got a huge following in Canada. There is this thing where God is responding to all the wickedness we see in the world and he's not just coming around just pointing out wickedness. That doesn't take a gift. But what takes a gift is a man who maybe wasn't a very good dad who says, I'm going to learn how to be a good father. And that father can change an entire family and then one day an entire generation of grandkids. That's what we got on us to do something about. And like you write in your book, man, we got to... Jesus is raising up the standard, right? Jesus is the standard for what a real man is. Jesus is a standard for a holy life. He's a standard for that. But ultimately, he's only the standard because he was a son. Right. Right. That's the only reason. He, no. We can't be like this warrior guy with armor on that's, you know, on a horse that slays the wicked. That takes no faith. I can buy my gun. 
I can get my horse or my ATV, get loaded up, locked and loaded, going, not my family. But you really want you really want to be brave and be a hero? You stand against those demonic powers and forces that are coming to rename and to regender our children and stand in the name of Jesus with the armor of Christ in and say, not on my watch, in the name of Jesus. I'm going to prevent this, and this is how I'm going to do it. Yeah. Come here, son. Let me tell you who you are. Right. Oh, wow. Let me you know, tell you, daughter. And that that's our call. That's what we need to do is impart that identity because you started this segment that we just started speaking about was that fathers are missing. And when they're missing, that's the picture that God gives us for how we relate to him as a father. Family is his idea. We see it right from the beginning in the garden where the whole family structure, this is God given. This is an expression of his life. And we get to represent Father God to our children by the way we father them. So this is really important, Ed. But what do you say to the guy that has these wounds and says, okay, I'm listening to this and I know I can do better, but I don't know how because I didn't get it from my father. And my father was missing the tools or whatever that man's going through, whether the father was missing, whether he's carrying a wound, maybe there was a a traumatic event or something that happened there. How do men start the process of healing to become the the father that their children need them to be? Well, here's, here's the great news about that. To get into this club, I'm inviting you in. And that's the club of real men. You got to be know you're broken first. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Right. We don't get in because we're good. Okay. We don't get in because we've lived on Gucci sheets. Okay. We're, we're a bunch that can't even spell Gucci, right? We're a bunch that many of us didn't have dads who knew how to equip us, but see an incredible promise that Paul prays. And this verse slayed me when I was 40 years old. And it's when he said, and the Lord God says, I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord God Almighty. So God's plan all along is to not only save us through his son, Jesus Christ, so we can be forgiven and have Christ now live inside of us, but he saved us also so that we would have access to be fathered by him so that he could undo and reshape us around the life of his son. See, Jesus came, and you know, a lot of, a lot of guys think, though, well, G- oh, the guy on the cross in the church, I've seen him up there. Or, you know, Jesus, he died for our sins. Yeah, I, I know that story. But they don't understand the way Jesus lived his life. He didn't live his life like a Superman or Aquaman. He didn't. He actually laid that down. The Bible says he laid down all of his rights of being God. Philippians says and took on the role of a servant, and and became obedient even to death on the cross. He lived a total life as what a what a man would be, and what he did to know what to do, where to go, how to pray for people, is as says in John five verse nineteen, that the Son of Man can only do what he sees his father doing. I when I read that, it just blew my mind that here's the son of God himself, who was the one in Genesis in his pre-incarnate form in the Trinity who said, let there be light. Because the Bible says that everything's been created for the son and by the son. So Jesus said, let there be light. Now here's the same guy who said, let there be light who puts on a cloak of flesh and models to you and me as is, 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 is a guy that he was a normal carpenter's son who learned how to hear the voice of his father, obey scripture, and live out the story that his father had for him. And what that says to me is there's hope. So I don't got to be Superman, right? And if Jesus at any moment in his walk would have put on his cape and started flying around, then me and you wouldn't have a model of being a man. He's the perfect man. That's why you say so well in your book. He's the standard, right? He's the he's the image, right? Uh, the, the image of God among us, right? And But his way, he was the standard. 
was he didn't use his own human strength. He learned how to receive every day from the Father. And that re- learning to re- see if you come um, to God, going, "Hey, Lord, I, you know, I'm, I'm doing okay. I don't need much today. Maybe this. I got this other stuff handled." Well, that other stuff you got handled is about ready to collapse. Because <laughs> I don't know about you, the things that I need faith for are things that are impossible to do without God. For instance, love my wife. Impossible. She lives in an estrogen river with monsters <laughs> in that river. I put on my estrogen extra large floaties on my arms. I jump in there. My head is mostly under the water. I come up every once for arrive for air, and I'm calling out to God because without his grace, I'm going to be eaten by that estrogen monster, and they will find me no more. Then have two more children, two daughters. So I got two daughters, I got a wife, I got three girls who are working me 24 hours a day. (laughs) And I went, God, help. And I mean, he just, in that, the the funniest that sounds, I was watching my daughters in my atrium and um, I just was desperate because I was failing as a dad. I was I was starting to get the picture of the blessing of the father for my sons because I had just had that encounter, but I didn't know how to treat my girls. And I'm watching them dance and put on Disney outfits and dance in front of my my office window. And I'm I just in, in desperations, I go, God, I'm in so much trouble all the time. What do women want? So I, I prayed Mel Gibson's title of the <laughs> And yeah. if you've ever seen that movie, I he have. electrocutes himself on accident and then has this ability to hear girls think, right? And so he uses that to get an upper hand. And so I even thought, maybe I should electrocute myself. Maybe I could get into that thing. And and I'm sitting here, I'm watching, and I just say, God, what do girls want? What do they want? And there's my daughter singing. And he speaks to me. The father just speaks into me in that moment. And he says, when a little girl is born, she's born with a question in her heart. Daddy, do you see me? Am I beautiful? Am I someone to be loved? And if you will answer that question, your daughters won't give their gifts away to a pretender. It was like a river went into me, brother. Yeah. I, I read... I read that in your book and I made, I took a lot of notes in this book and I'm, I really want to pump, pump your book up because it was so good. And um, when I, when I read that, I'm like, yeah, that's what I see with my kids. When I take them to the pool, when I play sports with them or do anything, it's always daddy, look at me. And it takes me back to my, it takes me back to my childhood because I took them to the pool and they want to jump in and get out and they want to play and look at me and give me attention. And I remember doing that with my parents, you know, dad, look at me, watch this. And it just took me right back to that cycle that at our simplest form, that's really just what we want is, am I seen? Do you see me? Yeah, Do you love that, me? You really don't need to brand yourself on social media to get friends, right? If you're seen by your dad and your mom. There's so, it's like, you know, where would... You know, social media, this whole thing was started by a guy in Harvard who couldn't get a date. <laughs> yeah, so you think about it, yeah. And so he so uses true. terms like friends, likes, right? Emojis now, all that stuff. But think about this whole thing. And how did that grow? It's not just technology, it's quicker communication. The promise of social media is that you can find out who you are here and celebrate it. You can find friends you don't know. So kids have 20,000 friends, but nobody who knows them. They get 20,000 followers, but who actually knows the deepest part? And that's one of the incredible things about being a father is that when you begin to realize you carry that identity piece, your first step is, Boy, I need to get that for me, from God the Father. That's what I talk about in my book and 
in our online course, How to Receive the Blessing of the Father for You, if your dad didn't have it to give to you. And then the second thing is from that identity of now being a son as a father, you begin to bless your children uh, in a way they don't need you to hold them up. They get connected to God themselves. It's like this, this transition of Jesus as a boy at 12 years old, and Mary finally finds him. And he now is fulfilling what God the Father wanted. And he moves from Mary and Joseph's son to, Mom, why are you looking for me? Don't you know I have to be about my father's business? Different dad. And when we learn how to bless our children, they meet their second father, the ultimate father. And when we're partnering with him, we not only learn how to be great fathers and husbands, but our children, when we're long gone, are going to be teaching our grandkids, hey, let me in introduce you to the father who has absolutely a blessing in Christ. And can you take us from the temple scene when Jesus is 12 to the inauguration of his ministry in the Jordan? Because we see something there, and you shared this with me about how the Father validates him in the Jordan, and we see the blessing of the Father modeled in Jesus's life. Could you break that down for us and, and, and tell us in practical terms what that looks like for us to receive or to give the blessing of the Father? Yeah, I was, you know, it all came about because I was, I knew I was missing something as a dad because I couldn't quit making my family about me. My wife was really good at pointing it out, by the way. <laughs> Go in there and hug your daughter. Uh, go in there, you know, you're too hard on the boys. And I was just driving them the same way I was. And I was at my desk where I am right now and had just screened at my son, Edward. And, and I said some things I promised I would never do to my kids what my stepdad did to me. You know, those moments where we all get angry and say things we don't maybe really mean. And it just, it named, it named me. He, you know, just, it hit me. Well, I did the same thing to my son, Edward. And I'm in my office here crying. And I cried out and I said, Lord, I, why did I do that? And just right in that still moment where God speaks, he says, well, you speak that way because that's the way you talk to yourself. Huh. You've learned how to hear my voice through the broken way your stepdad spoke to you when he was drunk and angry. Uh, if you learn how to hear the voice of the father, like Jesus did, I'll make you the kind of father who makes a difference. And it's like, oh, where's this in the Bible? Well, it's in at the Mount of Transfiguration with Peter, James, and John, and Jesus, God's a father, speaks, and it's in the Jordan River. And so I, I asked this question of the Scripture. Why did God audibly, at that moment, before John the Baptist, speak audibly over his son Jesus? And why did he call him beloved? This is my beloved son in whom I love. So I got an ancient book on Bar Mitzvah and ordered it from a Jewish guy in Queens, who charged me 20 bucks for shipping. <laughs> <laughs> How much was the book? <laughs> oh, five bucks. Five bucks. 20 bucks for shipping, right? That's Good great. Jewish businessman. And so he, I, I get the book, and I'm starting to read it, and I get to the end of the rites of Bar Mitzvah when a father stands up and says to his sons, this is my beloved son in whom I love, and calls him in the manhood. I went, oh, my God. Right there, right there in the River Jordan, there is a blessing. Matter of fact, Jesus didn't start any of his earthly ministry until that moment of blessing, that public affirmation where he could have called him Prince of Prince, Prince of Prince he was, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Savior of the world, Adonai, God with us. All those were roles that Jesus had, but God the Father chose agapitos, uh, 
an Aramaic word that it's it's kind of like it means the unconditional love and favor on that person I speak it over. You are my beloved son in whom I love. And I remember just saying to God when I'm studying this and going, well, my dad's dead. How am I going to get this for me? I, I, I need this. And it was, it was about three weeks later that I'm at a youth group and because uh, my youth leader got sick and I'm picking a scripture in the Bible to teach. And so I grab it and it opens up to uh, the book of uh, Matthew. And it's a story of Jesus walking on the water up and down the waves towards a disciple, says, don't be afraid. And Peter says, if it's really you, command me to come to you in the water. And Jesus says, come. Peter gets out of the boat, starts sinking, and then it hits me. This is the scripture my dad read the night before his plane crashed in the Monterey Bay at 400 miles an hour. He circled the word come in that story in his Bible that my mother found after he was reported missing. He could have bailed out, but it was Memorial Day weekend, 1956, and he rode his plane in. I'm reading this, and when I came to that word, Josh, all I can tell you is that the father I never knew I could have speaks to me, and this is what he says. The last word your father heard was the word come. That's what I've made you for. From this moment on, Ed, your name is no longer football player, pastor, evangelist. It's not about, in other words, your name is not about what you do. And then he said, you are my beloved son in whom I love. Those same words that ricocheted off the the desert floor and the river over Jesus that when we're in Christ, God's promise to us is to bless us with the same blessing and name that God the Father gave his son. Matter of fact, Jude, the half-brother of Jesus, the brother of James, writes to those who are called beloved in the Father, grace and peace and life to you. He understood what that sonship was. And in that moment, I just was undone. I was being blessed by the father I didn't know I could have. And I mean, I just sobbed in front of the kids. I couldn't speak. Ended up getting home and walked in the front door. And my wife looks at me and And she goes, please don't take this the wrong way. But something happened to you tonight. I don't know what it was. It was like you left a boy, and now you've returned home as a man. What happened? And I said, sweetheart, I just became a son. What Paul says that he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ in the book of Ephesians, you know, so that we could what? receive adoption as sons. And if and Galatians goes on and says, if sons were no longer slaves, if we're no longer slaves, heirs, it's like the whole purpose of God the Father for all of our lives is to come in and be the second dad in our story and father into us the very image and likeness of Christ so that we are equipped to love our wives the way we need to, with floaties on and all, to be the father our children need, and then to learn how to bless them publicly with our voice, to speak life into them. It's it's amazing when you learn to use this Versus being critical that you're easy to do if your dad was really critical with you 
or you're that way towards yourself to try to teach your kids that if you just get it right, God will bless you. But when you begin to teach them, no, Jesus did it right. That's why God's going to bless you. Guess what happens to those kids? They come back to churches. They discover that new identity and that old religious malarkey that the church puts on children when they're young gets broken away because they begin to discover God knew me before he made the heavens and earth so he could bless me to be a son or a daughter and fulfill what he has dreamed my life could be when I follow his son. And that's beautiful. Yeah. Awesome. So awesome, man. Wow. Your, your, your book is so amazing. There was so much gold that I took out of it. I literally have uh, pages of notes that I've taken as I was reading through it. Um, you know, I mentioned at the beginning of this, I, I didn't mean to make light of anything when I said I was laughing at some parts of the book because you tell your oh, story. Oh, man. I did some really <laughs> dumb stuff. <laughs> and I'm just thinking about, you know, like you after the NFL, you got into this lobster enterprise and you're on the boat. <laughs> and I was thinking about like, you know, Jesus calls Peter out of the boat and then like you literally got called. You know, we use that in Christianity, like take a step out. And I was like, take a step out of the lobster boat. It oh was my it, it was it was great. <laughs> it was great. No, I, I mean, yeah, you got to get the because I, you know, you know, fatherhood is not being about perfect. I remember was a young dad trying to teach. And I wrote this in the book as well, to teach my son, Edward, not to be afraid. So we're on a, a fishing trip up in the high Sierra Mountains, and there's bears everywhere. He says, bear country? I go, yeah. And if you run, they'll eat you. So don't run, son. You stand them down. You do a low look. You'll be okay. So I'm just playing with them, right? And so we're walking. We go through this big meadow, and there's a stream on the other side. And we get around to this stream, and sure enough, a really, really big black bear looks, sees me, and goes, and wow. roars up. And I went, run! And, I <laughs> and he goes, no, Dad! He will eat us! He will eat run, son! The slowest one is a Scooby snack! Ah! We're running through the field! I get home! All my man-like posturing, right? I get home and my wife goes, what happened? He goes, I almost died, Mom. Dad didn't look down the bear. I tried to, but he was running and I knew he would eat me if I stayed. All right, Ed, I, I got to know, when you ran, did you leave your son there looking at the bear or did you grab him? <laughs> what did that play out? I like? ran like H E double <laughs> hockey sticks. <laughs> I looked around, but I said, you better come. And he was booking it, too, because uh, he hadn't seen story. me run since the NFL. <laughs> that's amazing. That's 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 an awesome. And all that says is, is that you're going to run into places in your story where you you blow it. You make mistakes. And there is no mistake you can't change in your family if you learn how to build a culture of forgiveness. Well, hey, I mean, I'll, I'll just interject. I mean, I've had multiple times where I've had to humble myself because I got angry or, or something happened and I had to go to my children and say, hey, I overreacted or I was wrong about that. You know, do you forgive me? And I had to make it right. And it's it's powerful to do it. It's not always easy to do it in the moment, but it's powerful. And it needs you know, to be you know done. why it's so powerful, Josh? Because without you planning on doing this, you modeling how to ask for forgiveness has just sowed into your children that there's nothing they can't forgive if they humble themselves, right? You modeled this culture of forgiveness, and it starts with dads. And when you model it, your kids have a way to share their pain with you, and you can own it. And then they always have a way of going, hey, dad, would you forgive me for the way I just spoke to you? And you created this without coming in with a Bible and going, hey, by the way, we can't have unforgiveness here. Right, Everybody's right. got to forgive everyone. No, they need a, just like we did, we needed a YouTube video from our dads going, hey, Josh, you know, the way I said that was wrong, would you forgive me? How powerful that is with your dad. So now you've just hurt your son, little Josh, maybe Josh the third, 
and you go, hey, Josh, would you forgive me for what I just said? You've got this mo transferred model, and it goes generation to generation to generation. Now, there's a negative part, too, where you can pass on things that are really destructive. But I found that when you learn to do the other and to build these cultures of love, forgiveness, blessing, that's the most satisfying thing you can do as a dad. Because you're, 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 it's like uh, the other day I have my grandkids over quite often and, and I have 11 of them on the outside. I got two more coming and I'm watching my daughter say to her son, mommy's really sorry for the way I overreacted. I thought you did something and you didn't. Will you forgive me? And it hits me that I started that 15 years ago with her. And the fruit of that, I didn't have to go to her as a dad going, you know, the scripture says that don't let the root of bitterness grow up yeah, between yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, we all know about roots of bitterness, but that's a great scripture. But what's the model? Because me and you as men, if I want to fix my car, I look for a YouTube video or something. You know what I'm hearing you say, Ed, is that we, we, you know, like you can teach it religiously and say, here's the Bible. Let me quote the verse. But you actually become the word. You become the, the father personified to them. And that's so much more powerful. And we see Jesus do that. It's modeling. You actually model. And as you model, that's one of the best ways that, as you would say, lessons are caught. And they see well, it for themselves know, because they Jesus, were. He was the word made flesh, right? Right. And dwelled among us. He only begotten full of grace and truth. So he was the sermon. And I, I remember, you know, preaching when you're a, a senior pastor and preaching two and three times on Sunday. And I did conferences in, you know, 15 different countries. I'm preaching all the time, all this stuff. And I started to realize after years of doing this that. The most traction I had is when I shared my stories about how I put this in my life. And it gave guys a way. I would watch men. They'd go, they'd, just, they'd sit like this in the church. And then they'd, I'd, I'd say, you know, let me tell you what I did the other day after I really hurt my daughter. And they go. See, that's the missing piece for guys right now. We, it, we've had billions of words preached at them. It doesn't negate the power of the Word of God. But when it's not the truth you know that sets you free, it's the truth you do, right? And when you as a teacher or a leader or a father live this book out in real life in front of your kids, they know this Bible's true. But when you preach it at them of what they're not doing, that might have a little value, but that will further cement them in that they're not enough for dad. But and here, here's a little nuance, and I know you read this in the book, is the way you teach your kids to be honest is you go and confess your own sin to your kids. And I did that with my, I started with my sons. I said, look, dad's really struggling. I've been struggling with this. Can you pray for me? And they go, really, Dad? It's like I moved from Big Ed with the jersey on, right, to my dad, who asked for free. I remember the first time I did this, my oldest son, who was just like 11, 12-year-old guy, and he goes, hey, Dad, I struggle with the same thing. Could you pray for me after I pray for you? I said, absolutely, son. Wow, what a moment you created with that. Yeah, because that's that's incarnational, right, versus being... The, the the lie that's out there is that if I just, you know, if you just know the truth, the truth will set you free. That's in the scripture, right? But knowing the truth only happens when you do the truth. Because, you know, those stories that we read about, those guys live that life. It wasn't a theory. It was, let me show you, let me prove it to you. Right? They lived it out, and God came through and blessed them in extraordinary ways. 
but they had to live through the pain and the rejection and the hurt and the unforgiveness and then the forgiveness. And I mean, all that stuff. And we're reading their stories now, forgetting that God wants us to incarnate this and and to live this out in front of our wives, in front of our kids. And then that, my, my kids will say, you know, Dad, I've watched you all these years, and if you can do this, I know I can. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And That's it's awesome. like... <laughs> Yeah, I'm like really screwed up without God. But with him, I can be a son. Yeah. And be on the mend and make a difference. And this is such a great conversation. Um, We're going to drop links for the book and for your course. But why don't you tell the audience where they can connect with you, the resources you have available. We'll drop everything below. But as we start to wrap this up, um, let the guys know where they can get more resources and get more training from what you have to offer. Awesome. Well, a, a couple of things. This book that he's talking about, the how to become the husband and father your family needs. If you're single, perfect. Married, perfect. And it, it's, it'll take you through a video-based course, uh, master course, that teaches you in little chunks. So we do like five to eight minute video segments so that you can apply everything in this book. This book is, I wrote it like a playbook, which is a lot of my story, but it's the stuff I learned to do that God showed me. It's not Ed's best ideas about being a good dad. It's God fathering broken Ed and helping him discover how to receive this. And it'll teach you how to receive the blessing of the father and how to be a son and how to Love the girls in your story. How to love your sons. How to how to deal with single dad stuff. There's just a it's a lot in there, and as a gift to you, um, we're also will include a link, and we have a, a video course that has an on uh, an online group piece as well. If you want that, we're going to give that to you absolutely free as our gift, and it's normally eight hundred thirty one bucks a year to be a member of our group. But the Lord asked us to give it away, and we want to sow it into every guy that's out there who says, "You know, I want to be a better father. I want to make. I, you know, I want to. I'm a single dad, and I want to get the heart of my kids back. I want to. I want to learn how to li- love my ex-wife in a way where I don't have to demonize her every day, right? But I want. I want my kids back, and." Or maybe your marriage is struggling. We've had a number of guys in the last months in divorce court now planning their remarriage ceremony. They didn't get divorced because they learned how to build a culture of forgiveness. They learned how to receive a blessing. We have all that's in this course, and it's our gift to you. And you can get a hold of me, too, at at blessingofthefather.com and also on Twitter, Instagram, Rumble, YouTube, Facebook, everywhere. Just type in Ed McGlasson. We're everywhere. And we're we're here to help you become the best father you can be. Awesome, Ed. We're going to drop all those links below. Guys, follow Ed. We'll drop all his social channels below. Get his material. Read this book. It will make a difference. It's sound. It's full of scripture. It's got his story. It's entertaining, it's powerful, and most of all, it's transformational because I believe if you apply what's in this book, you can change your lineage, you can change your generation, you can change your legacy. Until the next episode, let's raise the standard. Hey guys, my name is Josh Kachadorian. I'm the author of the book, The Standard, Discovering Jesus as the Standard for Masculinity. And I just put together a brand new challenge for you, the ambitious Christian man. If you're in business, if you want to reach your full capacity, if you want to unlock your potential, I need to tell you there is an unfair advantage that is available to all Christian men, but not all access it. That's why I put together this free 11-day email challenge. Click the link below, sign up for the challenge, and you will get equipped with the knowledge, the resources, and everything you need to take your promised land and learn how to partner with your unfair advantage. Can't wait to see you in the challenge.